So uh, this evening, I want to talk about uh, really two sites at St. Francis, the original 1662 chapel site and house site, and then the 18th century uh, church, which is still there, and the manor house. So let's get going. For those of you who don't know where, I suppose you all know where St. Mary's County is and roughly where the site is. It's this big red dot here. And so we're going to be looking at these two sites, uh, each uh, more or less marked out in red. We've got the first one, the earlier one up here, which is a 1662 chapel site. And then down below the current church site, the new church, which dates to 1731. And do make a, do note the difference in location. The early one is further inland. And the later one is kind of out on the point. Uh, there, one is more visible than the other. And I think that's an important thing to consider in looking at the history of the Jesuit manor site. Anyway, we're gonna start out with Old St. Francis. Uh, I'm just gonna give it a 1662 date, which uh, is probably the year in which the chapel was built and ended around 1700 uh, when colonial laws pretty much put the kibosh on uh, practicing Catholicism in public. And uh, I will also point out too that I am not an ecclesiastical scholar or historian. So uh, ev everything I say about such things is certainly uh, uh, open to fact checking. Let's start off, I don't read this, I'll read it for you, but this is part of essentially the deed wherein, well, let's say, no, now know ye that I, William Breton of Little Breton, which is his patent in, in the county of St. Mary's in the province of Maryland. Gentlemen, with the hearty good liking of my dearly beloved wife, Temperance Breton, forever give to the behoove of the said Roman Catholic inhabitants and their pos posterity or successors, Roman Catholics, so much land as they shall build the said church or chapel likewise for a churchyard wherein to bury their dead containing about one acre and a half of ground. Okay, and you can find that Archives of Maryland. So the Bretons are giving this land to the Roman Catholic inhabitants. They're not giving it to the church per se. Uh, they're giving it to the inhabitants. The legal aspects of that I'll leave to legal scholars to work out. So the patent that we're talking about, uh, uh, Breton Manor is down in this, this part of this, this neck here. Uh, and this, these are really the two sites we're talking about right here at this neck. How did all this get started? Well, I think it was what, the 350th anniversary of the parish, uh, Father Brian uh, Sanderfoot, who was then the pastor at St. Francis, asked, well, commissioned uh, the late, now late, Scott Lawrence, to do a map of the gravestones out at the cemetery, which we did fairly quickly and, and easily. And then he also said afterwards, well, you know, we, we have this record that the Jesuits had their chapel site somewhere on this acre and a half. Can you find it? And so we said, well, yeah, sure, why not? So what we did was a shovel test pit. He commissioned us to do this work to do a shovel test pit survey. So approximately every 50 feet, avoiding graves, uh, we tested the entirety of this triangle here, which probably encloses much, if not all of the original acre and a half. In the Northern shovel test pit units, um, you can see this red uh, oblong uh, line up above, a couple of them, we recovered uh, bits of brick, which suggests a building. And we found some creamware and some British brown stoneware and some pearlware. These are ceramic types that date to uh, the late 18th century and possibly into the early 19th century. So just on the basis of a few shovel test bits, we demonstrated that there was a house site at that part of the cemetery uh, sometime in the late uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. That's not what we're looking for, though. We're looking for a 17th century chapel site. 
Well, on the southern end of um, the cemetery, and remember there's graves all over the place, there are gravestones all over the place. But down in this area here, we found in some shovel test pits, we found some uh, clay tobacco pipe uh, that looked like it could be 17th century. And we found, um, we found some mammal bone, not human. But more importantly, we found fragments of red floor tile. Now this is just basically really thin brick. Uh, so I recall measuring five inches on a side, just square tiles, which show up on 17th century sites, but they're fairly uncommon. Uh, but there's a pretty good bet, you know, if we're looking for a chapel site, that those tiles betray its location. So we ended up coming back with uh, some funding from the state of Maryland and with the aid uh, of the Archaeological Society of Maryland. We had this big 11-day uh, uh, excavation. And what we did was we created Camp Sanderfoot, which is right behind the rectory here. You could see some of our tents. And off to the left-hand side is, is the, uh, the current church. We built a, we had a shower, gas-powered shower out behind one of the uh, uh, outbuildings. And in the hall, in the parish hall, has a catering kitchen. That was our kitchen. So that's where we prepared meals and ate. So it was really pretty nice digs for a long-term excavation. An aerial shot of the site fairly early on. This was taken by uh, uh, Scott Lawrence, sitting inside of a makeshift helicopter uh, built and flown by Mike Smollett. Some of you probably know Mike. And so you can see the excavation units. You can see our vehicles. There's my old truck. There's Scott's truck. And I think that might be Carol Cowherd's car there. But you can see we've got this sort of patchwork of excavation units testing various areas to see if we could find evidence of the chapel. And here's just a sort of a typical excavation view. We we're excavating in five foot by five foot squares. So there's four contiguous five by fives here. And that's Sarah Grady starting uh, a fifth. You can see the little white bits there, that's oyster shell. So we've removed the topsoil, we're coming down on the subsoil, soil that ideally has never been disturbed by humans, except where they might've dug holes to put wooden posts in the ground. Actually, we found people dug holes there for uh, a lot of, uh, for some other things as well. Uh, in this excavation unit, you could see this is, these are cobbles and bits of oyster shell. Not a very thick layer sitting right on top of uh, the subsoil below the sod. This is fairly extensive in one part of the site and it looks like it's an intentional pavement because there isn't that much gravel in the soil naturally. And the cobbles are mixed in with oyster shell. It's not a, a, your classic shell midden that suggests, okay, this is a place where people are just throwing out household trash bones, oysters, broken ceramics and whatnot. It's a mixture of cobbles and oyster shell and it's fairly extensive, leading me to suspect it's some sort of intentional pavement. But you can see it's actually been disturbed. Somebody, you could see uh, this wavy edge here. This is a series of three grave shafts that dug through that pavement. Bodies were put in and the holes were backfilled. So you see some of the bits of cobble and oyster shell that were originally part of that pavement and now are redeposited in the grave shafts. Those grave shafts probably have some interesting uh, 17th century artifacts in them because the site was a little disturbed at the time those graves were dug. So whatever was lying around became incorporated into the grave shafts. Uh, the north end of the site, you can see this is Myron Beckenstein here and me. Uh, we've also, against that subsoil, we've uh, identified some post holes, what appear to be structural post holes. Uh, that suggests we've got a building. Just examples of the recording forms we use. For excavation unit 61, you can see this is definitely a post hole and it's got a mold. So this is a, where somebody dug a hole, set a wooden post in the ground. We have another one, it's definitely a post hole mold over here. This one here is kind of hard to tell because we didn't expose enough of it. And who knows what that is, could be a scaffolding post hole. 
Over in unit 65, on the other hand, we've just got classic grape shafts. Uh, so you can tell basically by the geometry of these things, you get a sense of how deeply dug the graves tend to be dug more deeply. So they have more lighter colored soil from deep down mixed in the fill and the post, the post holes aren't generally quite as deep. So here's a map of sort of the core part of the site, not in its entirety, but you could see all these in red are graves. The place is just peppered with graves, including this area here where I mentioned, I showed you that picture of pavement and the three gra uh, grave shafts intruding into it. This is an older map, but, you know, it's never been updated. And this is the kinds of things we're finding. Uh, on the left, we've got these classic unglazed floor tiles. Again, these are about five inches on a side. They're about an inch thick. They look like brick, except they're very thin brick and they're square rather than rect rectangular. We also get uh, got a lot of uh, window glass and of course, lots of nails. The nails, to the extent that they can be identified, many of them could be, they're all uh, hand wrought nails. These are not machine made nails. These are nails that are at least pre-1850 and probably considerably older. Uh, for those of you who've attended these talks before, you're familiar with this surface mapping that we do this uh, trend surface analysis where we take the counts of artifacts and weights of artifacts, different artifact classes, we run them through a simulation program and it creates something that looks a lot like a topographic map, only instead of elevation, it's showing us where there are greater and lesser concentrations of different kinds of artifacts. Uh, most of this is based on weight, not counts of artifacts. But you can see floor tile, major concentration up at the north end of the site. A little bit as you get further south, uh, is that south? Yeah, south. Uh, but really a major concentration up here. And that by itself suggests that that is where the chapel was located because it's the chapel that likely would have floor tile rather than a dwelling. You see also concentration of nails. Nails are kind of all over the place, uh, but still they tend to be concentrated in the north part of the site. Window glass as well, although a smaller concentration again to the south. So these three distributions suggest that there are two buildings and one of them, the, signature, the clear signature for it is the, uh, the floor tiles. Some of the domestic refuse that we found, you know, the kind of stuff that you, garbage you generate or trash you generate around the house, um, not a lot, but a fair amount. I mean, we've got uh, on the upper left-hand corner, uh, this is North Devonshire uh, Scrofito ware. This comes from the West Country of England, uh, as does the piece next to it, this yellowish, yellowish piece. We have some stonewares, uh, Rhenish stoneware, British brown stoneware that uh, could be German, could be uh, English. Uh, this piece down here, these pieces, th this is part of a candlestick holder uh, made of some sort of leg glazed redware. We don't know where it's from. And these, this cluster of stuff, um, uh, ceramics down here, these are all tin glazed earthenwares, uh, probably from England, but uh, they could be from further afield. And also kind of interestingly, I think, is we find we've got a couple of these pieces of clay tobacco pipe made of a red clay with this classic design on it. And I put a comparable piece that we recovered over in Anne Arundel County we call it the running deer pipe. These things show up um, throughout this region, dating mostly to about the 1650s, maybe into the 1660s. Uh, so you can see here the body of the deer, its legs, neck. Here's the body of, of a deer and the neck from a second example. These are almost certainly made by Native Americans and yet the shape of the bowl is consistent with the European design, not with the Native American design. So that's why I think these things, and I think most archeologists in this area share my um, assessment that these are probably made by Indians for Europeans. So it's a kind of really key artifact, as small as it is, the key artifact that uh, shows us that these two groups of people are still interacting. Indians are still here. 
uh, more classic uh, clay tobacco pipes, probably mostly from the West Country of England, you know, like the uh, uh, North Devonshire ceramics I just showed you. And I, I won't blind you with too many of these numbers and charts, although I find them really fascinating. But um, uh, let's take it. Um, you can see we look at the bore diameters. Ten, we, we take the pipe stem. We use drill bits of certain size to measure, to get an idea how large those bores are. And through the distribution of those bore diameters, we can actually get some sense of when a site was occupied. So they run from 10 sixty-fourths of, uh, of an inch in diameter to as little as 4 sixty-fourths. And we just count the number of pipe stems in each of these categories. And so you can start to see the distributions and how they change. And then we use a couple of, I just use one here, but we use a couple of or several uh, algorithms, mathematical formulas to calculate what's called a sort of the mean date, the central date. We don't know how, when the site was first occupied based on tobacco pipes or when it was abandoned, but we have a rough central date. And that's what these numbers are here. And when we look at St. Francis, which is in the dark font, you can see it's associated with a group of sites, including Mattapanai Sewell, which was um, Charles Calvert's site up a uh, Pax River Naval Air Station, uh, Smith's Ordinary in uh, St. Mary City, the Broadneck and Burley sites, uh, which are up in the Providence portion of Anne Arundel County, and the Pyle site, which is just kind of a salvage thing. And then other groups of sites, we have Tuxen Point, Mellonfield, Swan Cove, all these are a little bit later. And then the early 18th century sites tend to be this last group here. And if we look at the distributions, the heavy line here is St. Francis. So based on the pipe stem distributions with, a with um, the peak uh, 764 inch diameter pipes being the most common, you can see this site is associated with these that have that same uh, unimodal distribution at 764 fourths. We have other sites that have these little plateaus where they have two or even three uh, modal points. These are later. And then we have a group of sites that are much later, the early 18th century ones that have a modal point of around 560 fourths of an inch. So you don't need to understand the mathematics necess necessarily, but you can see using these pipe stem bore diameters, we can not only get a rough date on the site, but also how it relates to other sites in the region. So enough of that. So some of the other things we found, we've got, uh, I think just one example here. Uh, there's no scale and it's not a great photograph. I apologize. Uh, there's also, as I recall, sort of a, a garland that's um, uh, molded into it. It's sort of a floral thing. This is a curtain ring for hanging curtains. Uh, and that suggests uh, sort of consistent with what they found at St. Mary City that it's not all rough and tumble out in the frontier, that there is some aspects of gracious living around uh, it, on the frontier. And certainly for a lot of house, uh, households, having curtains around a bed would be uh, important in the winter to keep folks warm. It's also privacy for uh, couples uh, in a house that's otherwise full of people. Uh, and if you want more people in there, you need a little bit of privacy. One of the more interesting artifacts we found, and it's, it's a relative rarity in uh, Catholic Southern Maryland, where we actually find an artifact where you can say, this is related to Catholicism. Uh, this is related to religion. And yeah, it looks, it looks like a swastika. And the reason it looks like a swastika is because it is a swastika. Um, but as uh, George Reisling, who was working with us, uh, discovered, uh, this is a very common uh, motif uh, around the world, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, South, India, South Asia, uh, North America, Native Americans, very common type symbol, probably more or less represents the sun. Uh, maybe hints of everlasting life. Yeah, we know it's not part of some sort of German insignia. You know, it's not from some SS uniform uh, for a couple of reasons. One, you can see from these bad pictures as a very thin piece of stamped 
uh, copper alloy metal. That's not the kind of thing you find on a uniform. You know, military insignia it tends to be heavy brass. So it's very thin and also has, you can see it pretty well here, this nice vine motif running through it. Apparently the sort of thing you'd expect to find uh, on, a, on a soldier's uniform. And so George did a little searching around. Actually, he was doing some of this from his uh, cell phone out in the field soon after we found it and ultimately published the paper on this in Maryland archaeology. But it was a very common um, uh, late medieval Renaissance, early modern uh, Christian decoration, Catholic decoration. So you can see it's part of uh, this priest's um, uh, a gown, little little type swastika is over here too, and it points to the areas where they show up. And also on this soldier, almost certainly a crusader, I don't know who Sir Thomas the orderly was, but I assume he was a crusader, and you can see it on his belt. So Nazism gave this symbol a bad name, certainly in the 30s, 1930s and 1940s, but this kind of symbol has been around for many centuries, perhaps millennia, and usually meant something far more benign. But it suggests that what we have is part of um, a priest's uh, garment. Possibly it was used as a decoration on a book, like a Bible. I suspect it was actually part of a priest's garment. Okay, and getting back to our features, which are uh, one of the more important aspects of the site. I got two maps here. One shows just the features, the archaeological features that are not graves. And up at the north end of the site, you see a bunch of the in blue. These are, these are post holes. So this suggests that we've got a building up here. And remember, that's also where we have a lot of tile and also nails and window glass. The features down here uh, are mostly that pavement I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, cobbles and oyster shell mixed together. On the right side in red, grave shafts. This is one of the major problems with doing archeology span on this particular site is that it's riddled with graves. It's been used as a cemetery probably from the early 1660s, right on up to the present. You know, we're still burying people at St. Francis. Fortunately, not over in this part of the site. Um, and when you look at this part of the site, there's only a, you know, make couple of dozen gravestones uh, dispersed across the area. There are a lot more graves than there are gravestones. Most of these people were buried in unmarked graves or they were marked with a wooden cross that has long since deteriorated. Uh, getting back you know, to clustering around these features, again, at the north end, we've got structural post, hole, post holes. If we look at the distribution of all artifacts, uh, architectural artifacts, tile, window glass, nails, together look at their weights, we can see that there's a fairly large, you know, massive cluster here and here, and a small one slightly to the south. Those, uh, the cluster to the south uh, might have looked, well, this is probably, probably didn't look this nice. But this is the Godaya spray uh, reconstruction down at historic St. Mary City. City. I, I stole it off their website, the picture. But we're looking at some sort of timber frame building with a, uh, a, a fireplace and a chimney that maybe is at the gable end or maybe it's in the center of the building. Here they have the center, we don't know. But that's the kind of structure we're looking for, built with wooden posts set in the ground and then a chimney base, a hearth, that's also a series of posts set in the ground, and then branches, poles set in those posts, and then branches woven in to create sort of a basket work assembly, which would then be plastered with mud. And the mud part that's on the outside, the like, top of this chimney, through you know, temperature and humidity changes, it's gonna to begin to crack eventually, and it's gonna to need to be replastered periodically. The part that's down by the hearth, that will also crack because of the intense heat of the hearth. And that could become a problem because if the mud cracks away, it's going to expose the timber framework underneath. And that and fire do not go together well. So we do have, I, I don't have pictures of Fern Daub from um, St. Francis, although Lord knows we have plenty of it. 
This is from the Dove's Nest site, which I talked about a few months ago. But it looks like brick when it's been exposed to the fire, you know, right around the hearth. So this stuff crumbles out, has to be periodically replaced. Where we find concentrations of it, that's where there was probably the fireplace. And so on this map on the left, there's a concentration of burned dog. Nowhere near where we think the chapel was, where these post holes are. We haven't found any post holes here yet. We need to look more. But almost certainly, this tells us that there was a brick chimney, there was a uh, Wadland Daub chimney right near this location. So that's one of the reasons I think that there was a house down here at the south end of the site. The window glass, if you look to the right, is mostly up at the north end. So very likely that the chapel had windows and the house or had glazed windows and the house just had sort of sh shuttered apertures. With tobacco pipe weights, a lot of the tobacco pipe fragments are in the south end of the site because that's where people are hanging, smoking, talking, socializing. Uh, ceramic and glass, there is some up by where we think the chapel was, but there looks like somewhere in the middle ground, there's a, a midden, you know, a trash midden, and the, then right down the south end of the site again, which is probably where these folks were actually living. So to make a schematic of it, what we've got uh, is a concentration of tile, wind, floor tile, window, and nail at the north end of the site, indicating the chapel, uh, with some vessel sherds as well, ceramic and glass vessels. And then a smaller cluster down here of window and nail, but not floor tile. So this suggests that this is where the approximate location of the dwelling and then the trash associated with it. So if you look at the far left-hand side here, uh, this is just a three-dimensional image of what I just showed you, but uh, peaks of architectural debris up here suggesting the chapel lower peaks here showing the house. Now, when you look at vessels, which kind of stand in for all general trash, the main concentration is the south end of the site. Very recently, the uh, parish erected a, uh, a ghost structure approximating, I mean, it's, it's not based on actual measurements of a footprint of a chapel that we have found because we need to do a lot more excavation for that uh, in amongst the graves. Uh, but it's probably a reasonably good rendition of about the size and nature of this thing, uh, of the chapel. A simple wooden structure, not all that different from the dwellings built at the same time, probably not heated, uh, probably just a frame structure with windows. Uh, we've seen no evidence of a stained glass window, certainly. Um, and with a tile floor, very likely with people, some people buried under that floor. This chapel was probably standing for, uh, and used for two, three, four decades. So it's very likely that there are people buried underneath. And very likely they would be, if any of the Jesuit fathers or brothers died on site, they probably would have been planted there. The house site uh, almost certainly was used by the Jesuits when they were visiting because they're pretty much on a circuit. They weren't living there year round at the, that point. Uh, the artifacts suggest the site, the house site is a little earlier than the Jesuits getting there, sometime in the 1650s, which suggests it may have been a tenant house. One of the, I think uh, William Breton had 11 tenants, uh, tenant farmers, if you will. And I suspect this house was one of them. And when that tenant died or moved on, um, the house was then available for the Jesuits. It was probably when that tenant left that uh, the Bretons decided to give this land to the uh, Roman Catholic inhabitants of the area. Anyway, so that's, let's see if I get my thing here to move. There we go. So that's old St. Francis. New St. Francis, uh, we know it's 1731 because people tell me it's 1731, the uh, so called new church. And again, it's, in a, it's much lower down on the peninsula, uh, still a narrow part of the peninsula. This is the current uh, kind of church property here. I mean, this, these aren't necessarily the boundaries, but this is where the church and manor house are located, some the barn and uh, 
the parish hall. There were also a number of agricultural buildings that used to be located in here. Uh, they've long since been raised. But this is a much more open, much more exposed position, uh, which given the uh, antipathy towards Catholics um, by the Protestant uh, inhabitants of Maryland, uh, this is pretty much kind of in your face. Um, I think very different from the original site, which was a little more, a little, a little more obscure. So here's a view uh, of the uh, St. Francis as it appears today. The church is here, the manor house, uh, tobacco barn that's now being used for storage, the rectory, and the parish hall. And of course, all around it uh, is the state park. So you can see the church. For those of you who have not been there, I encourage you to go visit. It's a pretty little church. It's uh, been well restored. Um, it is active. Um, I don't think the doors are kept unlocked, but the uh, uh, pastor does live there on site and it shouldn't be too hard to arrange admission. And in the lower left-hand corner is the manor house. Not quite the way it used to look. It's missing its porches at this point. Um, and it would have been surrounded by a variety of outbuildings. But it's still there and folks are actively working on its restoration. And if you're interested in getting involved with that, I see uh, George Matissic is on this call. I'm sure he'd be happy to secure any donations you'd care to make. This is a map created by uh, Dennis Pogue, who uh, was a Southern Maryland regional archeologist back in the early 1980s um, out of Patterson Park. And he did a, a project down here is basically doing a survey he didn't look at the early St. Francis, he just looked at the new St. Francis. And this is a map showing what was there, including a variety of barns, again, uh, between the driveway and the road that leads through the state park. Uh, those are all long since go gone. This is just uh, a parking lot right now. But you can see the church, rectory, parish hall, uh, the uh, uh, barn over here, tobacco barn, the manor house, and a standing ruin, a brick ruin, which you'll see a picture of in a moment or two. And this here was, does not appear on the surface. You can go out there, you will not actually see this rectangle. But that is a foundation of, an, of uh, I think, an early, a building earlier than the manor house. So here is the manor house in the lower right-hand corner with what was, there was a porch at the time, now gone, uh, in the process of being rebuilt. And out in front of it, Dennis and his team found bits of foundations. And you can see this portion here is blown up over here. So it's a good brick foundation. And it actually, he actually found a structural post hole and mold inside of it. So it's, very, it's possible that there was an earth fast building before there was this brick foundation. Uh, either that one building was replaced the other, or perhaps a uh, brick foundation was added and an earlier earth fast building was expanded on that brick foundation. We don't know. At any rate, this building here, this the foundation is only about that. It looks like this structure was occupied perhaps while the manor house was being built and at some later point demolished. Dennis did shovel testing out there. That's what all these little X, that's what all these little crosses are about. This is that projected foundation. And this is a distribution map uh, using a cruder program that I, I've been, that I used and that we looked at earlier. But this surface, this trend surface analysis suggests that there's clusters of pre-1790 artifacts in these locations, especially right here. And then if we look at post-1790 artifact distributions, we still see major clusters around this structure. To me, that suggests that the structure, first of all, was a dwelling. Second of all, it was built and occupied before the existing manor house. Thirdly, it continued to be occupied after the manor house was constructed, which I think was in the 1780s if memory serves. 
So this structure may have continued in operation for a little while longer before eventually being raised. Also on the site, again, here's the that foundation is over here. There is a chimney or, or brick ruin over here. We have an early 20th century photograph of it. Today, it's, it's, it's much smaller. We, a good part of its height has been lost. Uh, Michael Humphreys, uh, uh, a school teacher in the county uh, back in the 1970s, uh, worked, did some archeology span around the structure with students. Unfortunately, we have little or no notes or artifacts that survive from that excavation. So we don't know what this thing was. At this point, we don't know what it dates to. Uh, this is an area uh, that certainly warrants some archeology, span if for no other reason than to try to recover whatever information Michael Humphreys originally uh, revealed, uh, but which has since been lost. When we were out there in, I think this is in 2019, uh, I came back to the church. Uh, they commissioned me to do some archeology span around the manor house because they were thinking we need to deal with storm water. Uh, we're getting water infiltration into the basement of the house. And of course, that's causing humidity, mold problems, damaging wood, just, just all around terrible. And they had no specific plans. I mean, one of the things that was being kicked around was digging essentially a French drain, you know, basically a backhoe trench around the entire building, filling it with uh, uh, gravel and drain tile with some fabric over the top and then soil on top, basically a big drain that would drain to the Southwest. Uh, so we went out there and among other things did this topographic map that's what uh, I think a uh, quarter of a foot interval. So it's a very uh, fine grained topographic map of the site uh, showing also how that water would drain is already an existing drainage ditch running to the southwest. Get rid of the topography and I can show you what we did. We did a series of excavation units around the edges of the building to see, you know, is there anything of archeological significance uh, that might be damaged uh, in any number of scenarios of stormwater drainage, uh, stormwater management. So we dug a bunch of excavation units, um, uh, eight of them around the building, and then two on the other side of a drain uh, that was already there. On the north side of the building, we found a septic pipe that had been run through the building and which was a, probably a major reason why water was getting into the building. But you'll notice here, look at this, you see, you can see this yellowish brown spot here, right? But you can also see it in the profile and you can see it comes way over here and then up. This is a backfill trench. Sometime, probably around 1990 or so, Folks dug a trench around the building to repoint the bricks to get the old uh, mortar out of the joints and to replace it. And that was probably, I guess it was a good thing to do, but in doing so they disturbed the natural structure of the soil, which may have contributed to water moving through that soil more easily and into the building. Uh, but there's still a hole here to which water comes. And you can see some archeological deposit here that we recovered a little bit of material from. From around the house, what we found, we found a fair amount of um, er, probably early 19th century uh, ceramics. Most of these are pearl wares up here or early white earthen wares. Uh, so we're looking at dates from around 1790 to maybe 1840 or so. We've got some American stoneware here that's been painted. We have a quarter which came out of my pocket. It's just there for scale. Uh, pieces of wine bottle, uh, typical of the 18th and early 19th centuries, actually it's probably more 18th century. And part of a cauldron, a cast iron cauldron. Uh, again, the quarter is mine, we didn't find it there. And this is just sitting in a bed of sand at the lab. But this is the leg of a cauldron. This is the upper, you know, getting to the upper portion of it. Cooking pots like this would have been present on most of uh, these colonial era sites, uh, different sizes used for a variety of different things, but mostly cooking. 
And the thing about them is when they break, they're broken. They're like ceramics. They're of absolutely no value. Uh, it's not like there's an iron furnace nearby where they can buy the scrap and smelt it and make something new out of it. So it gets tossed. So what we found actually with these units around the building was we have a really thin topsoil there. Most of the soil around the manor house had already been eroded away. And um, we did ex what we exposed were water joints, brick joints. They're actually in great shape. Uh, if there's water infiltration problems, it comes from where that sewer pipe came through, which is up here, and also by some ground level windows leading into the basement down here that are just a few inches above grade. So when there's a heavy rainstorm, water is probably washing in from there. The upshot of this is it didn't seem like a good idea to be trenching around putting a French drain around this building. It just didn't seem like it was necessary. Uh, it was more likely to create problems uh, than anything else. We anticipated that there was a drainage ditch here. We anticipated that, well, maybe they'd want to recut that drainage ditch to just take surface water away. So it made sense to dig a unit on each side of it just to see if there was anything that might be damaged. Well, we know, uh, actually go back for just a moment. There's, it doesn't show up well on this map, but there's a little bridge here that goes across that ditch. And that bridge is right by uh, this young lady, uh, Louise uh, Pilkerton, I think her name was. And judging from the gown, I'd say early 20th century. So there's this little bridge here and the concrete supports for it is still there. Actually, we found a pretty large piece of uh, wine bottle in there, I think, or pearlware. And we also know that somewhere over here was a pump. And that's where this gentleman is pumping water and drinking it, posed photograph of the manor house in the background. So somewhere around here is a well. Well, when we dug our excavation units, both of them on each side of that trench, we hit uh, oyster shell midden. Uh, the midden on one side looked like it probably was part of the tenant period of the manor house. That is when Jesuits moved out, they uh, leased it out to tenants, I think from 1868 on into uh, uh, the 20th, well into the 20th century. And the midden on the other side actually had some earlier stuff from the Jesuit occupation. So uh, there are archaeological deposits on either side of that uh, drainage ditch that could really shed some light uh, on the lifestyles of these two very, two, two very different groups of people. Uh, there's also a large tree next to one of the middens. I suspect, I think it was a cedar tree. I suspect it's sitting right on top of the well. So at some point that tree will die as groundhogs digging underneath it as we speak. Uh, it will die and it'll have to be removed. And I think when that happens, uh, there'll be an opportunity to do some excavation, expose the, uh, the well. And that well very likely dates back to uh, the Jesuit occupation of that part of the site. So it could date back to uh, the 1730s. From those middens, we didn't do any, you know, we identified uh, uh, the elements and species represented. There's no detailed comparative analysis with other sites in the area. Uh, it was a little beyond our brief and uh, we would need a larger sample, but you could see we get black drum, cow, uh, ducks, uh, probably mallards, uh, pig, sheep, turkey, turtle. Uh, there's a bunch of unidentified fish there, but a uh, larger sample is likely to produce some identify, uh, will be able to identify the species that are represented. So this, there's food remains here from the Jesuit era, and there are some also from the uh, tenant era, 1860s and later. So there's a lot of data to be had from this site, which can then be compared to other sites in the same period, just to, to look for differences in how these folks are living. Anyway, that's about all I have for this evening, but I want to take this opportunity to talk about uh, Laura's work. And, and instead of me talking about it, since she's online, uh, Laura, would you be interested in talking about what it is you're doing and how folks uh, perhaps can, can get involved? Um, so we're going to be out at three different sites this summer, and we're welcoming volunteers and visitors to come on out. 
Um, I'm a professor at Catholic University uh, and, and just, just a couple years in there. So I'm uh, still, still trying to get students involved in these projects. Um, but I know there's a lot of, you know, local interest. And so um, I encourage you to, you know, reach out um, if you're interested in coming out um, and, and working with us. So the work that we're going to be doing is, you know, not too, too far away um, from, from what Jim was just talking about. Um, around the manor house. So Tim Horsley did some um, GPR results. I, I hinted about this in the chat, um, did some GPR survey. Um, and, and there's a lot of buildings around the, you know, the standing manor house and church, um, in addition to the, the earlier manor house um, that you saw some, um, some maps of. Um, and that one's real, real clear. And so we're, we're interested, you know, one of, one of our major goals is to try and find slave quarters um, in the vicinity of the house. And, and that's a, it's a, it's a thing that's easier proposed than accomplished. Um, but we're trying to get a sense of the larger landscape, especially in the period before maybe 1850 or so, um, trying to look for kitchens um, and various other types of uh, domestic dwellings and outbuildings. So. Um, we, we have some great uh, GPR to work with, and we're really looking forward to, to going out and, and getting our, our feet wet at Newtown. Yeah, so uh, you're going to be at St. Francis um, um, July 12th and 23th. Mm -hmm. um, and I have your email address up there so folks can get in touch with you. Uh, you're also going to be up in, but that's Cecil County. We'll bugger that. You're also going to be up in Cecil County and at Webster Field. And I just wanted to make a note to folks. Uh, I mean, it's nothing stopping you from stop, dro dropping in St. Francis at any time. It's pretty much publicly accessible. But if you want to work with Laura, you should let her know beforehand. And Webster Field is a naval uh, uh, facility and you can't just show up. <laughs> so you yeah, need to contact yeah. her in any case. Uh, yes. As far as uh, old Bohemia goes, I don't know, you're on your own there. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's out there. It's a, uh, it's public land. So um, the hardest part is finding where exactly to go to out there. So we're heading out in the field tomorrow and i um, excited because we, we've done a shovel test survey out there and uh, um, it's, you know, it's right by the Delaware border. And so we've actually have, have one volunteer from the Archaeological Society of Delaware who's been, been working with us on this survey for the, for the past year. So we're excited to actually finally open some test units there. Um, we had two comments in the chat apart from, apart from yours. Uh, one was Jane mentioned that in the research at Historic St. Mary City, uh, focusing on the chapel there, they found that the, um, the Jesuits did not go in for uh, stained glass, which is good to know. I did not know that. That wasn't something we were particularly looking for. Uh, but since we didn't find it, there's a reason, I guess. Uh, and the other, someone also asked about where Father Sanderfoot is. Um, I, I, last I heard, he was in a parish just outside of the District of Columbia, uh, maybe in Anacostia area. I'm not quite sure. George uh, perhaps knows. But I can't tell you uh, what a thrill it was to work with that man. He was so, he's so smart and articulate and so down earth. I mean, we used to sit, we used to, you know, our Camp Sanderfoot, named for him, uh, we'd set up some chairs in the evening after dinner and sit around drinking stout with, with Father Sanderfoot. And uh, he'd, be, he'd come out in the field and work with us sometimes right after mass on Sunday sometimes and he'd be wearing his, his nice black outfit and getting dirt all over it. Um, it. It was a real joy to work with him. And I was really sorry to have seen him leave. Um, but uh, I, I'm not quite sure where he is these days. I don't know where he is. Jim? Yes. Uh, Father Sandenfoot is up at St. Francis de Sales Church off of Rhode Island, I, um, Rhode Island Avenue in Washington. in Washington, right near Hyattsville. Okay. I, I, I now remember the name of the place. I had a rough idea about where it was. But really, this whole project started uh, because of him. Uh, he, you know, he came up with some money to do the original gravestone mapping. Then the original survey, uh, he was very generous. Um, 
been very, very supportive. And as a result, we've learned a lot about this uh, interesting site. And hopefully, uh, Laura will take it to uh, the next, next stages. Uh, but it will also be nice to get back to the old St. Francis, do some more excavation, see if we can find a footprint to that chapel in amongst the graves, and also a footprint of the house.